Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Indie Interactive, where we talk about making great music, connecting with your audience, and growing your business. My name is Bree Noble. I am the founder of Women of Substance Radio Podcast and the Female Entrepreneur Musician. That's the page that you're on right now. And I'm also the founder of the Female Musician Academy. And I am here today with Michael Laskow from Taxi. I am so excited to do this interview and to be able to uh, talk with him about subjects that you guys are interested in and to ask him your questions and get his feedback. So let me know if you're here in the chat, if you know any musicians that could really benefit from this conversation that have been curious about Taxi, be sure and share this with them right now. Um, as we get started, I want to let Michael give you a little bit of background on Taxi and uh, who they are, uh, who they serve, why they do what they do um, before we get into your guys' questions. So if you guys have some questions as he's talking, go ahead and put them in the chat. And uh, I will just have Michael give you some, some background right now. So welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for being on. Just let them know a little bit about what the history of Taxi is, why you started it, and you know who you serve. All right, thanks for having me on, Brie. Hello, everybody. Yeah, very enthusiastic crowd. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's from Taxi TV, I had to hit that button. Anyway, uh, I started the company 26 years ago. I used to be a studio rat uh, back in the mid 70s, uh, working with a lot of big bands. And uh, at some point ended up doing audio post-production because I found I could have a normal life and spend time with my family and missed music uh, sometime in the late, uh, we'll call it 1991. I made the decision to leave the corporate world and start this company that connected unsigned songwriters, artists, and composers with record labels, publishers, and music supervisors who wanted to hear music. When I had the idea, I didn't have the idea of setting up a filter though and curating the stuff. So the industry didn't immediately warm up to the idea until the day that I said, what about if I have all these out of work people who are as qualified as you are, who've been VPs of A&R, who've been a music supervisor, or maybe still are, um, who've been a publisher and uh, been a hit songwriter, and they actually listen to everything that's submitted to make sure that it's on target for what you're looking for and is at the quality level that you need. And then we'll send you, or as we like to say in taxi parlance, we'll forward you that music. So you're only getting the on target cream of the crop. And they went, uh, yeah, that's a good idea. So that was 26 years ago in 1992. Um, We've been doing it ever since. Uh, we do it for people all over the world. Our focus is largely film and television now, just because that's largely where the industry is. Um, we've got thousands of members in over 100 countries around the world. We publish about a thousand listings or requests for music a year. Um, could range from singer songwriter stuff to what I affectionately call stupid little instrumental cues that could be as simple as an acoustic guitar with a dobro that would be something you'd find in one of those alligator shows, or it could be a big orchestral piece that would get used in a film trailer, for instance, or stuff that you would hear in reality TV, which, uh, you know, look, it pays pennies, but it adds up. We've got members that um, have broken the $100,000 mark. We've got a couple or a handful of members, actually, that are over 200 k so that's where the industry is. Uh, we still do a lot of stuff as well for record labels and artists that are looking for songs or labels that are looking for new artists. Um, we do charge for the service. It's $299.95 for a year. Um, people say, oh my gosh, I've been told I should never pay anybody to listen to my music. Well, you know, that that's pretty true because there are a lot of scumbags out there that have ripped people off by charging them to listen to their music and have no outlet. Um, do it very disingenuously, but Taxi's been around for 26 years. I'm pretty sure if we were some sort of scam, we would have been found out by now. Um, we offer a one-year money-back guarantee, and yes, occasionally people will join Taxi uses for a full year, get deals through us, and then ask for their money back. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Uh, 
Oh, but for that two ninety nine ninety five a year, we also include the Taxi Road Rally, which is our convention that every single taxi member gets a free pass to and a guest pass. So uh, it's coming up November 1st through the 4th this year. And uh, there are just so many things that we work really hard at to help people not only have the opportunities, but find out what it is in particular that the industry wants and how they can shape their music to take something and make it more commercially viable for that entity, whether it's a music supervisor or a record label or an artist. So there you go. Thanks for letting me do a run on sentence. <laughs> No, I, I, that's really, really helpful because I think a lot of people don't know what taxi is and, you know, there's a lot of like conversations in Facebook groups or between people and, you know, you know, maybe they didn't have a good, they didn't get any forwards or whatever, and then they get bitter. You know how things go. And like, if you yeah, look on, <laughs> look on Google, you know, one of the things that comes up is, is taxi a scam? Um, right. That's true about any music curation kind of thing like taxi you know is music x-ray a scam is broad jam a scam you know because musicians can you know get their bee in a bonnet or whatever about something that happened to them on the site but i love what taxi does because it does connect you with people that you can't possibly connect with on your own it also doesn't just like say yes or no, they give you great feedback. When I was in taxi, you know, I really did use that feedback that I got on the critique forms to actually go and edit your songs and not enough people do that and then resubmit. And I know that um, my friend, Michelle Lockie, we've had this conversation where like when she finally started, you know, not being defensive about the critique that she got and she actually went in and edited her songs, then she started getting forwards. And then she started getting them placed other places, you know, outside of taxi because she took the advice. So why don't you just talk a little bit about how the critique works? Sure. Um, like I said, the people that are judging the music are all real experts. A lot of people want to believe that they're interns or some sort of B-level person. Um, we can't base a business on that. You could walk in here any day of the week, pay a surprise visit and find unbelievably impressive people sitting at the workstations um, listening to the music. Uh, and they're giving feedback to say, basically, in a nutshell, here's why it didn't work for this request. And oh, by the way, I noticed this aspect that you might be able to improve if you did X, Y, or Z. It could be, excuse me, it could be, um, you know, it, it's a pretty song. It's got a nice melody. The lyrics are very heartfelt, but they need to be edited and be more compact. And the chorus doesn't pop out enough. So why don't you change the drum figure, add some instrumentation, uh, you know, shoot up to a, a note in the lead vocal at a key point that's an octave higher to make it more emphatic. Those are the kinds of things. And some people don't want to listen to that stuff. It's like, hey, I was born a songwriting genius. And if you don't recognize my genius, then you suck. And I'm going to go on the internet, tell everybody that you suck. The people who go, wow, you know, I've always kind of had a feeling and you guys confirmed it. That's great advice. Thank you. And they start incorporating it. They go on our, our forum at forums.taxi.com. Um, forums um, that's totally free. You don't have to be a member to participate in it. They get feedback from other members who are more experienced. And over time, between our convention, the forums, the feedback, watching Taxi TV every Monday that we do free and live for people, don't have to be a member. Um, it all adds up to, wow, I'm actually a music professional now and I am earning my living doing what I love to do, which is make music. Mm, I got to say, Robert in the chat is, says that he loves Taxi because it helped him get his game up. And that's very true because we're in our own little bubble, right? We're, like you said, we all think we're songwriting geniuses and you know, our biggest fans, or our family members have told us that our music is amazing and everyone should listen to it. And, you know, it's, it, it might be good or there might be really great parts and then some parts need work, but sometimes it's maybe that your music is good, but it doesn't fit the listing. So someone was asking in here, um, how do you make decisions on whether it fits the listing or not? Based on years of experience, uh, the person who will be listening to your music uh, when it's received by us for a particular listing was chosen to review that listing. And it could be one, two, three different people, depending on the quantity and their availability. They're expert in that thing. 
So let's say it's hip hop for a record label. We're going to have somebody judging that, that, you know, has made some charted hip hop records or was senior director of A&R at a label and, and has been doing hip hop for 15 years. That's the level of people. Now, uh, ooh, I lost my train of thought. So, oh, now film and TV, interestingly enough, if they're looking for hip hop for reality show, hip hop instrumental cues for reality shows, do you want an expert in hip hop or do you want an expert in reality show instrumental cue music that hip hop also falls under their umbrella, which might include swampy acoustic or orchestral as well. Personally, I'd go with that person because they're hearing it through the lens of this is hip hop that would work while Kim Kardashian is trying to get the cap off a milk container. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know. It seems funny in retrospect. <laughs> I saw that in an episode once. You couldn't do oh it. Oh my gosh. Uh, but, you know, and, and they played this comedic hip hop music under that. And I thought to myself, now that would never work on a record. Somebody who judges hip hops in an A&R position at a record label would never sign that. But yet it was perfect for that scene. So we really have to think hard and choose our screeners, our A&R people on those particular listings well. And that's how we do it. They are listening for those two aspects. Is it on target and is it good or great? Awesome. I love that you are, you know, you're very meticulous in who you choose as the screeners for the particular uh, opportunities, which is really, really great. Um, so I wanted to kind of bring up, as you mentioned, the forums. Um, what's so great about your forums at Taxi are they're totally free. And I know, again, I'll mention my, my friend, Michelle Lockie. One of the reasons that I have you on this show is because of Michelle and her recommendations and uh, the fact that she's going to be uh, doing a workshop with my audience in a few weeks on music licensing. So uh, spoiler alert for those of you guys that are watching, um, watch for that because Michelle does a great workshop on music licensing and she's spoken at the taxi road rally and she really got a lot of her start in because of taxi. So um, try those forums out. I mean, she has some songwriting groups that she works with there and uh, they have some like critique swaps and stuff that they do that have been really helpful for her. So that's one great resource that taxi offers totally for free. Like you don't even have to be a member. Um, but I did have a few questions that were pre-submitted and I wanted to run those by you. Um, I wanted to ask about genres because um, some of my students, they've been members of Taxi before and they felt like, you know, maybe their, their genre just didn't fit for enough of the listings. Um, some of those people have maybe been like folk artists or Christian artists. Do you have any kind of rule of thumb for, you know, if you need to have enough of a certain kind of music to make the membership worth it? Uh no, we don't have a rule of thumb, but obviously uh, we're a reflection of the industry, uh, of the real industry. Um, when was the last time you turned on your radio and heard a folk hit? Mm -hmm. uh, not that I don't personally love folk music. I'm a child of that era, so I do love it. And, and obviously there are folk labels and, and there are folk charts, but it is a lesser genre as far as the quantity of music that comes out to the public. You could say the same for jazz, um, you could say the same for many genres. So Taxi is merely a reflection of what the industry is looking for at any point in time. My advice to those people, whoops, uh, let me get rid of that so it doesn't happen again. Um, Okay, my advice to those people is we offer all of our listings for public perusal for free, all of our requests for music. So yes, somebody that does dancey pop music um, will get a lot more uh, opportunities because that's what the industry is looking for, both in, in you know, record label stuff and film and television, because film and TV is often reflective of current trends. Um, but there will be scenes, let's say in an indie film, uh, we had one where a young man was standing over the grave of his father going through some bittersweet memories and they needed kind of a folky singer songwriter thing. So those certainly come up. 
Um, and interestingly enough, people often overlook the instrumental category mm -hmm. because they could be looking for folk instrumentals, something that's textural for a scene where somebody's walking down a country road, but a folk songwriter or a folk artist wouldn't look under the instrumental category. Mm -hmm. So my advice to everybody is go to taxi.com and on the front page of the website, there's a red button and you can click that and you can get on our email list and see the listings that come out every day of the year, except Christmas and Easter. And, <laughs> and see, you know, if we've got requests for what you do. Um, and let's say that you are somebody who creates music in one of the less requested genres. Well, isn't it better to have 32 requests in a year, even though somebody else might have 132? Um, 32 is better than zero. Um, so there you go. Yeah, and for sure, like the fact that you ha offer the the road rally tickets for free um, when you're a member, uh, that pretty much pays for itself. So you know, it's a great conference. I've been a couple of times, um, and it's worth it there. So even if you got a few listings that you could apply for, and you got to go to that conference, I think that would already make your membership worth it. Um, I'm just curious though, do you ever get like retro listings? Like they want something that sounds like '60s music or or something. Yeah, not only do we get stuff where they're looking for music that's made to sound retro, like a current recent recording that has like, you know, let's say a 60s surf music vibe mm. or 60s folk vibe, whatever. Um, we actually work with uh, the largest publisher for vintage music in the industry and probably no single entity that Taxi works with has more success with our members than that publisher mm. because we're really good at finding music that was created in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And you'd be shocked how many people have cassettes of demos they that they did in 1979 and they think, oh, it's terrible. Nobody would ever want it. Surprisingly, this company, if it's, it doesn't have to be a great song. It doesn't have to be a hit song. It has to sound like it's authentically from the era and be a decent, what I would call a C plus recording. Could mm -hmm. have been done on a TAC four track. They will take that. They run it through software to clean it up. They don't make it sound too good because then it becomes inauthentic sounding. Mm -hmm. And you'd be shocked how many shows, if you really pay attention to your TV set, which I know we're taught not to do, but if you pay attention to TV, you go, wow, that sounds like something that should have been a hit in 1974, but I don't recognize it. That song probably started out with a taxi member, went through one of our listings and ended up with that company that then got it placed on a primetime drama on ABC. Mm, that's really cool. I'm glad I asked that question. So am I. Uh, a great question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering... So some some people like Music X-Ray, they have kind of a matching service. I am assuming Taxi doesn't have that. You have to do your own research by looking at the listings and then apply, right? Yeah, and the reason we don't do that is if we were matching you, <laughs> it was us determining what you match to. Um, I, I personally think that it would be very tempting to have kind of a money grab. It's like, oh yeah, that matches this. Mm -hmm. um, look, uh, if you're... Before taxi existed, and I believe that we were the first entity of this kind probably on the planet, um, if you were a songwriter back in the day, um, you had to know what you were writing for. You had to know artists that might cut your songs. You had to know what genre you were working in. Um, and there was a certain amount of responsibility. I compare it to selling shoes because when I was 15 or 14, I was a shoe salesman for a summer. And if a lady walked into the shoe department and said, I need a size seven and a half B beige pot de soie pump, and I brought them out a Cordovan men's penny loafer and a nine and a half D, they'd look at me like, what the hell, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way the industry is. When they ask for, you know, uh, mid 70s folk, they don't want 1998 um you know, whatever. Uh, so you need, I think there's an onus on the creator to understand what it is they're holding in their hand. And anybody that does that matching for them, um, no, we, we just choose not to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's, it's just way too hard to really find a real match for it 
unless it's being submitted versus like trying to use some kind of algorithm or something like that. Um, so someone had a question about the, um, about the cost. So I know that you, you have a membership fee and then you pay per song submission. Do you have any all-inclusive membership fee that would allow you to submit as many times as you wanted if you paid a higher membership price? No, and there's a really good reason for that. <laughs> I think you know what that is because you're smiling so much. I do, and I take submissions myself, so I get it. Uh, yeah, the reason that we even charge the submission fee, frankly, and, and I made it $5 because that's what, I, I think that LA Songwriter Showcase 25 years ago uh, charged like $10 per submission. So I went, okay, I'm going to charge five because it's half as much. And the reason we charge is to keep people from submitting everything they've got for every opportunity because people will. We all know that, that, you know, what the hell? I'm, I'm going to submit it because it doesn't cost me anything. I'm going to submit this uh, disco song for a folk listing. <laughs> I got nothing to lose. So we charge a nominal $5 fee to make people think, Am I being unrealistic here? Am I being a little schmucky? So uh, no, we don't do all inclusive because if we did, they would make a bunch of submissions very quickly because they would be kind of unharnessed, <laughs> if you will. And, and then they would run out, of, you know, they would hit their cap and, and they go, oh man, bummer. You know, I made 50 submissions in the first month and now I got nothing left for the rest of the year. So no, that's why we do it. It's actually in-house, we call it the discouragement fee. Yes, it's to protect you guys from yourselves and your enthusiasm for your music, which <laughs> I mean, I, I'm all about enthusiasm, but you know, we need to be very targeted when we're submitting. So I, I do, I'm all about that um, discouragement fee for sure. Um, so the really good question before we're going to jump into questions that have been submitted directly here live. So if you guys have any more questions, throw them into the chat and I'll look at those in a sec. But one more great question I got in advance um, was since you guys started 26 years ago, um, Shar was asking with the rise of DIY artists and changes in the music industry, um, how has that changed your business in general, like your business model? You know, honestly, the the only aspect really that's changed is that more people have the ability now because uh, your laptop is a studio. Uh, and back when I started Texas, I saw an Alesis ADAT where you could do eight tracks of digital on a VHS tape with like a Mackie console. And all of a sudden I said, wow, rather than renting a studio at 150 bucks an hour, now anybody with a song in their heart and in their head can lay it down. Well, of course, now that's been taken to an exponentially bigger and easier methodology using laptops and computers and software. So if anything's changed, it's, it's been that there are more people making music, but um, it's hard, harder to get a record deal and harder to have a hit with a record label. I, I will say that. And probably easier to be successful is an indie DIY, but very few people will do the amount of work that it takes to become successful. Mm. Think about it. The one or two percenters that got signed to the major labels and had big deals and big records back in the day are probably reflective of the same one or two percent of the indie people who mm. make it today. And it all comes down to work ethic, almost more than talent, because I don't believe that people are just born to be amazing and don't do any work. They just show up. They're amazing and everybody loves them and they get a private jet. Doesn't work that way. Agreed. And hopefully, and I think they are, you know, that one to 2%, a lot of those people are in my female musician Academy because these ladies are hustling. They're working hard. They have great work ethic. Uh, many of whom are here today. Um, so Fiona Jane has a, she says, this is a long shot, but do you have any listings for theater and cabaret music? Extremely rare. And uh, I would not advise joining taxi if that's what you do you will see maybe one or two opportunities a year where somebody wants cabaret music. Uh, we do get requests for like French cabaret stuff that would play in the background. Uh, remember the movie Inglorious Bastards a few years ago and there was a scene fairly early in the movie where they're in a basement bar and having some sort of meeting with some Nazi officers. And, and hypothetically, you could have heard some cabaret music playing in the background of a scene like that. Um, so film and TV stuff, yes, on rare occasion, but certainly not worth 
joining Taxi to take advantage of that. Mm, well, thank you for being very upfront with that. Um, Sheila says that she's thinking of joining, but she feels like the like music licensing world is kind of like playing the lottery, <laughs> which I thought was a very, you know, upfront comment. I agree that it is kind of a, like sometimes you just don't know what it is that they're looking for and you have to take chances. Well, let me address the lottery thing because I've heard the word lottery probably a hundred thousand times over the 26 years. Like, why would I want to join taxi or, or pitch my music? It's like playing the lottery. Here's the big difference. The lottery is a game of chance. You buy a ticket and you don't have a better chance than any one of the other hundred million people or whatever that number is that buy a ticket. It, it is purely chance. In the music industry, and particularly in music licensing, you get to control the outcome to some degree by, did I read this request three times? Do I really understand what they're looking for? If I don't understand, did I call taxi to get clarification? Excuse me, did I go on the taxi forum and run it by other members to see if they're understanding it the way I did? When I finished my music, did I put it up on the forum for other people to hear and go, yeah, we think you nailed that genre. So there are all these little things you can do that are things that help you eliminate the lottery factor. It's not pure chance. You can absolutely improve your odds by being more professional. And if I may interject, because that question opened the door for this, Taxi's business model is helping amateurs who've and defined amateur defined by people who have not made money professionally with their music yet. Our business model is to help grow amateurs into professionals, people who do make money with their music. And the difference between those two types of people is not just raw talent. Frankly, raw talent doesn't have a whole hell of a lot to do with it. It's developed talent and it's work ethic. And it's acting like a professional. Um, I edited a thing this weekend where somebody was talking about uh, one of our members giving advice to other members. He said, look, if you get contacted by a production music library, uh, don't reach out to them multiple times a day. Why didn't you like my music in the end? Why didn't you sign it? Or do you want me to send a bunch more right away? Lay back and don't look like, uh, oh, my God, oh, my God, they love me. They love me. There's nothing, that, you know, it, it's probably a little bit like dating. If, if the person that you're dating comes out of the gate really strong on the first date, like want to come over and have matzo ball soup with my mother at the end of the first date, you're going to run like hell. <laughs> so uh, the same would be true as a musician take it slow. Oh, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. Let me know if and when you need something else. Yeah, that's a really, really good point because it's true that like you can make a library gun shy if you're like, if you feel like they're going to be emailing you every day, you know, because they're just so excited about it. I mean, just, just act professional for yeah. sure. And it's hard to learn what professional is when you're in a bubble working out of a mm -hmm. studio in Chillicothe, Ohio, and you don't know. It's not like you're a dum dumb. It's just you don't know what you don't know. Yep, for sure. That's why you guys should be listening to my podcast, because we talk about treating your music business like an entrepreneur. And we need to, you know, approach people as a business person and not just like as an amateur musician. So um, the industry just breathed a collective sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, so what Sheila says, what, do, what differs taxi from publishers? Uh, a publisher takes a hundred, this is a course in and of itself, but yes. for every song, there is the publisher share and the writer's share. And if you think of a dollar of income earned, from the publishing, there is, let's say half of that dollar is 100% of the publisher's share. The other half of that dollar is 100% of the writer's share. And as the writer, you get the writer's share. A publisher, um, in the context of film and TV, which is different, by the way, than a publisher that would publish your songs and pitch them to Lady Gaga, let's say. So uh, they take basically, it's more often than not, it's a 50-50 deal. They get you placed and they get half the money. Why? Because they go to the trouble of registering it with a PRO, ingesting it into their catalog, doing the paperwork, 
and then the pitching of it and then doing the paperwork if it is successfully pitched and then tracking the income and getting the income to you. Um, there are many, many things that publishers do to earn their money. Uh, taxi helps you get to publishers because our mandate is to help you become successful with your music and generate income. So we will get you to publishers and we will also get you directly to music supervisors, TV commercials, what have you, where sometimes those people come directly to us and there is no publisher involved. Therefore, the musician gets to keep 100% of the income, the publisher share and the writer share. Yes, absolutely. Getting that direct access is very valuable, but also getting access to publishers because they've got connections that you don't have. So absolutely. yeah, Taxi is kind of just a a one stop for like all kinds of different opportunities. Um, and if you're w wondering more about like that whole conversation about publisher share and artist share and all that, Michelle Lockie goes over that in the workshop that we're gonna be doing in a few weeks. So watch out for that um, and be sure to register for that workshop that we're having. Um, let's see. So Carol says, Carol's been a longtime taxi member. She loves you guys. Um, she says that a few years ago, you had a children's music supervisor that came to the road rally. And she's wondering if there's anything like that happening this year. I think she's already planning on going. We don't have anybody, uh, the, anybody who's ever had a kid has wanted to work on a children's, uh, record or write children's songs and count me included in that. Um, so Yes, we, we recognize that there were other members that wanted opportunities for children's music. And the gentleman that came actually owned probably the largest independent children's record label in the industry at the time called Music for Little People. Hmm. Uh, that label eventually got sold and he retired. So it's kind of tough getting him out of his tree fort to come over to the road rally because he's not really actively in the business anymore. Uh, frankly, something, uh, I'll, include this in the children's music discussion, which is unless your song or songs are tied to a TV show, a character or a toy slash product, generally speaking, it's very, very, very difficult to get a children's hit as it were. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, but obviously there's probably a lot of, there are some opportunities to actually use children's music for TV and that kind of thing. Yeah, if there's a scene where a mom is, uh, think of the movie, Bad Moms. Uh, and if the mom like shoves her kid in the room, here, you know, go, go watch Sesame Street or something, you know, and, and they need children's music ostensibly to be coming out of that TV set, that would be an example of when it would mm. get used in the context of TV. Good example. Um, why don't you just give us a few highlights of this upcoming road rally? I know you're working on all the speakers and everything right now. Carol was wondering if there's anyone talking about metadata, but I think it would be helpful just to know in general, like what are, what are the things you're excited about for the road rally this year? Um, metadata specifically, yes, there will be people that will uh, either teach a class or talk about that on panels in the grand ballroom. And for those who don't know, metadata is all the information that's embedded in a digital file. So if they use your music, they know who to pay. They know how much of the song you own. They know the song title. They know the publisher, all that kind of, and your contact information, your phone number and email address should all be embedded. And you can do that by going into iTunes, the info section and putting all that stuff in there. Um, so yes, every year we have at least one, if not two or three people that address metadata, sometimes in great length. Other things at the Road Rally that I'm excited about. Um, last year I did what I can say, we've done 21, I believe 21 previous Road Rallies. Last year we did something that I thought was excluding moments where we've had people like Lamont Dozier or Robbie Robertson or people like that on stage and just had gold dripping from their mouths, um, leaving the star factor out of it, just going with straight up, I'm learning stuff. We had a woman last year who was a video editor on reality TV shows, and she did an hour long segment showing how she picked music for a scene um, a bunch of music, not just one piece, but a bunch of instrumental things for, you know, th a three minute scene, let's say, and how she picked it. Um, and she would audition several and go, ooh, that, that one looks like it's got possibilities. I need nine and a half seconds. Let me find the right nine and a half seconds. Let me edit that. Let me put it in there. Let me 
you know, mix it in and out as far as when it bangs in, when it fades out or whatever. Um, she was so good that I remember thinking during that, that this was the best single thing we've ever taught in that stage. Mm. At this year's road rally, I'm bringing her back and giving her more time to open up the entire weekend. Because when you see what she explains, all of a sudden you go, wow, now I understand the why. And it helps people understand it's not about being the greatest composer. You're not trying to beat Hans Zimmer. You're not scoring a Hollywood block, you know, a hundred million dollar Hollywood blockbuster. You're coming up with a, a piece of instrumental music that has to help support the excitement in a scene. Let's say people are excited because they discovered something. They got a new dog and you need happy, excited music. So it's the right music in the context of video. This woman was such a great teacher, did such a great job that that's the thing I'm probably most excited about. And that's why I'm putting her up front because the ballroom holds a thousand people and I want every seat filled for that. Other stuff we're doing and I'm looking over my list. Um, we're doing music licensing, uh, uh, listening and feedback panels where we have uh, music supervisors and music library owners listening to music, um, picking it, taking it for their catalog, um, striking deals with the, the people who created it if they want, um, and giving feedback. We are going to have, um, oh, I'm interviewing a woman, um, uh, Sharon Farber, who is, I've been watching her career. She scores feature films and, and does um, live events as well. But she is a legit composer of just incredible talent. And I've been watching her career for years. This year, I'm going to interview her on stage to find out what it takes to get to that level in your career where somebody picks up the phone and says, I've got a feature film that I want you to score so that people can understand the progression of, of things that need to happen to get to that level. And frankly, I'm doing it because she's a woman and uh, you know, it, it has been a, a men's club for years. And, and she's one of the few women that I feel is really breaking through. And I, uh, my wife and I had uh, Sharon and her husband over for dinner one night and just found them to be amazing people. Like we fell in love with them. So I'm so excited to get her in front of the, the panel at the road rally or in front of the ballroom at the road rally. Um, I'm probably, I'm, I'm still toggling on this one, probably doing a thing on how to work faster and more effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're doing uh, instrumental cues for film and TV, you know, if you do, one cue sort of kind of maybe a week and you do it like 30 weeks a year maybe you've got 30 cues at the end of the year our members that are making six figure incomes are doing one or two or three cues a day 300 days a year and they do that year after year and after five years they start to make what i would say would be tens of thousands of dollars a year and after 10 years they might be breaking the hundred thousand dollar mark and after 12 to 15 years, some of these guys are up over $200,000 a year because they get up every morning and they just do this as their job. Good example, uh, we have a, a taxi member named um, Randon Purcell. He starts at 6 a.m. every morning and does three hours of music before he does his regular work and does that every day. So I want our audience members to learn from these people who have figured out a system for being effective like that. Um, Let's see, uh, we're doing a thing uh, with a woman, um, Beth Warnick, who is a, a publisher for film and TV and gets a lot of placements. And she and I've been friends for a very long time. And she called me about two months ago and she said, you know, last year when I was on the panel at the Road Rally, I kept wanting to interject, these are the reasons you're not getting your music used. And I said, well, why don't we do that this year? So it's just going to be um, Beth and myself with me interviewing her and going down kind of a, you know, these are the top 10 reasons your music's not getting used, which is frankly, every bit as important as why music does get used. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. Um, I'm still looking at my scribbled in notes in the margins of last year's thing. Uh, where the exact words she said on the phone to me. Uh, we're giving an award to Matt Hurt, um, who's getting the John Brahaney Award, which is kind of our, our greatest honor at Taxi. Matt was probably the first Taxi member to really uh, go, you know what? I can get instrumental and songs, but I, I think at the time, primarily instrumental music placed in film and TV. 
And he has quietly and methodically done that now for probably close to 20 years and been over the six figure line for many of those years. And he is kind of the genesis of a taxi member mantra, which is write, submit, forget. Don't wait by the phone, you know, uh, just stay productive, keep submitting, and eventually it all kicks in. So we're gonna present him with the award and interview him. Um, Man, this thing sounds amazing. And this is, so far you've only heard like three. Uh, and right. doing, I think I'm doing 16 or 17 panels in the ballroom. We're doing 75 to 90 classes on top of what's going on in the ballroom and one-to-one -one mentoring where people can pick the mentor that they get 15 minutes with, kind of like speed dating. So yes, anyway, I've done yeah. that before. It's pretty interesting. Um, let me throw a few like quick fire questions at you that are coming in through here. Uh, do you have a statistics, like a percentage of the members that pay the yearly membership, how many of them get forwards? Yeah. Um, last time I checked, but frankly, it's been years, probably five, six, seven years now. But the last time we checked, it was about 40% of all members get something forwarded. Now, here's where that number gets uh, wishy-washy, probably in favor of the musicians, which is, okay, so they got one thing forwarded. But what it doesn't take into account is some members might get 67 things forwarded in a year. So that's not thrown into the calculation. So that was us taking a sample, I believe at the time of a thousand people and making sure, okay, who had at least one thing forwarded and the number was right around 40%. Mm. Um, the next follow-up question is always, well, how many of your members get deals? And we've long published a number that 6% of our members get deals. That number was also ascertained years ago. Uh, frankly, very few of our members even bother to tell us when they get a deal. They get excited, mm -hmm. they tell their mom, they tell their friends, they tell their co-writers, they don't tell us. Um, and, and the industry people that are signing them don't have the time to be calling taxi and going, oh, by the way, I, I signed this guy last week or I placed this song in that movie. Um, they've got many more things to do rather than keeping us in the loop. And because we don't make any money from their success, we don't see a, pay, a financial paper trail. So with that 6%, like the other number, that was people who reported from a sample group that they had gotten a deal, whether it was a film and TV placement, a record deal, a song placed with an artist, any of that stuff. But what it didn't take into account is somebody like Michelle Lockie that's had you know dozens at this point, or somebody like Matt Hurt who's had thousands. So that was only, you know, have you gotten one deal? So that number 6% is probably way low, but we'd rather under pitch it than oversell it. Mm. Yes, good to know. And it's true. There's probably those that are getting tons of them. And then there's other people that are getting one. And then sometimes there's people that pay the membership fee and they don't submit at all. <laughs> so they're in there too, um, just because they want to go to the road rally or they just thought they were going to get stuff done and they didn't get any songs ready to pitch and that kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of hard to really be sure about those numbers. Um, so Adele had a question. She has some of her music already like with a publisher and she's wondering about can she still submit that and you know she needs to then get permissions from that publisher i'm assuming you would say she needs to get those permissions before she actually submits it to any of the taxi opportunities it goes beyond those permissions because well first of all is it signed exclusively or non-exclusively right i'm it's assuming she's saying it's exclusive yeah, if it's exclusive, then um, even if she got permission from the publisher, it gets really sticky because let's say the publisher has an assistant and the assistant does pitching for the publisher and the assistant pitches that song to a request for a TV show, let's say. And now Adele calls up the publisher and the publisher says, sure, you've got my permission to pitch this song. And now Adele pitches it to the same opportunity, but the publisher and the assistant haven't spoken to each other because who the hell's got the time to do that, you know, multiple times a day, every day. So now the same song is being pitched to the same person by the creator and by the publisher. And sooner or later, that's going to come back to bite everybody on the butt. <laughs> yeah. So moral of the story is, if you have a, an exclusive something with a publisher, you let them handle that. And if they're not doing a good job, then you pull it. Yeah. 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 Assuming that you've got a deal. And look, a lot of publishers, frankly, um, 
Uh, you know, they're not going to take phone calls all day long from people go, you've had my music for six months and you haven't gotten anything for it. It's not like they're out there beating down the door like they did back in the days of the Brill building. Basically, they're filling orders. It's a, a pull system rather than a push for film and TV in particular. They're getting requests in all day long and then searching their catalog going, what do I have that would fill that request? Rather than knocking on the door of every TV show going, I've got Adele's awesome song, you should hear it. The answer from the TV people would be, well, why should I hear it? How do you know that I've got anything that would even line up with what Adele's song is right now? So mm -hmm. that's the secret is giving them what they need when they need it for what they need it for. Absolutely. So um, just to wrap this up, cause man, we've had a lot of great questions. Um, wanted to mention about the, the road rally because some people are saying, you know, where is it? When is it, it you know, hotel, all that stuff. Um, your membership fee does cover the actual conference. So you don't have to pay a conference fee, but you do obviously have to put yourself up in the hotel and get yourself to Southern California, right? Where is it, where is it being held and when? It's November 1st through the 4th registration uh, where you get your badge and everything takes place on Thursday evening, uh, November 1st. The panel start on November 2nd, which is Friday morning. They go all day. Um, and it's like I said, panels, classes, one to one um, mentors and even uh, uh, an industry um, eat and greet. Um, so that's on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And it ends around 6 p.m. on Sunday. Um, generally speaking, we have 2,000 to 2,500 people at the road rallies. Like I said, they come from everywhere, like Singapore, Brazil, UK, Canada, you name it. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's held at an airport hotel, really nice airport hotel, right next to LAX. You don't need to rent a car. You don't need to deal with LA traffic. There's a free shuttle that runs every 15 minutes. The hotel rooms, I believe, are, I want to say $137 a night, which is a pretty cheap thrill for the quality of hotel it is. The networking alone is amazing. The content is amazing. And uh, you get a pass for yourself as a member and a guest. So you can bring a bandmate or a spouse or whomever. Yeah, I, I've been a few times. It's great. I One of my, that really stood out to me was Pat Patterson. He's amazing. Um, just so many different people that speak there and, you know, about songwriting, about licensing, about, you know, those pitch panels are really valuable information. So um, definitely consider it, you guys. Um, let's see, Lori, I, I did want to say that Lori mentioned she's learned a ton from Taxi TV. So that's another resource for you guys too. How would they watch Taxi TV? Um, go to uh, YouTube and search Taxi Independent a &R. That will take you to our YouTube channel and then you can sign up. Click the little bell thing up in the upper right hand corner and you'll get alerts. But we do it every Monday, um, probably about 49 to 50 weeks out of the year. Um, every Monday at four o'clock Los Angeles time. So six o'clock in the Midwest and uh, 7 p.m. on the East Coast. Um, pretty much like clockwork. And we do about a 90 minute show on every topic you can think of. And it's free. So it's a YouTube live. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. people can. Yeah. You said it much more succinctly than I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds great. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. Well, thank you so much, Michael. This has been really helpful. Um, I'm so glad that I've been able to really explain to my audience and you have what taxi is and why it would be useful for them. Um, as I said, I wanted to do this as a lead in to Michelle Lockie's workshop that we're going to be doing in a couple weeks. So definitely, you guys, if you're interested in music licensing, check out the workshop that we're going to be having on the 13th of September. Watch for Facebook posts and for uh, emails about it. If you're on my email list, so you can sign up to join us. It's totally free and it's going to be really, really informative. And she got a lot of her start through Taxi. So she highly recommends it as well. And she's a working um, artist who is also making money through placements and licensing. So thank you so much again, Michael. I appreciate you being here. And for everybody, this is going to be a podcast coming out on Wednesday as well. So if you want to listen to this again, or you can always go back and watch the replay here on Facebook. Thanks again for joining us for Indie Interactive. We'll be back next week on Monday, always at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for having me, Bree. Thank you, audience. It was a pleasure. Bye, you guys.